Hello and welcome to the Genetics Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Short. My background is in population genomics and studying the genetic causes of rare disease. I did my PhD at the Sanger Institute in the University of Cambridge and have been in biotech since 2018 when I started Sonogenetics. Sonogenetics helps academic and industry researchers to run large-scale genetic testing programs that speed up their clinical trials, generate data sets for the next big breakthrough, and give participants the best possible experience taking part in research. Each episode of the Genetics Podcast, we bring you insights from the leading minds in genetics and precision medicine, including household names and Nobel Prize winners, as well as early career scientists and biotechs working on the next big breakthrough. Whether you are a scientist, entrepreneur, executive, patient advocate, or simply someone curious about how genetics shapes our world, you're in the right place. Thank you for listening, and let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Genetics Podcast. I'm really excited to be here today with Alison Watson, who's the co-founder and CEO of Ring20 Research and Support UK, and also the founder of the UK Rare Epilepsies Together Network, that's UK RET, R-E-T. I had the pleasure of speaking to Alison actually back on episode 20, and um, and we talked about her journey into the advocacy space and, and patient-initiated research and, and what brought her to this. So I'd really encourage you to go back and listen to that episode if you if you joined us after episode 20, which was back in October 2019, which feels like a lifetime ago now. But I'm really excited to be back today. We're going to pick up on some of the discussion from last time and and hear a little bit about what progress has been made in in this you know particular rare epilepsy, but also Allison's work to bring multiple rare epilepsy groups together. So Allison, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, Patrick, for inviting me back. It doesn't seem like five years almost, so... I know it's unbelievable. I'd love maybe if you could just recap a little bit about your story. How did you get into spending so much of your precious time working on this for people who haven't listened to your previous episode? Sure, of course. So my reason for being in this space and coming into this space is really my son, David, who's 26 years old now. Time absolutely flies. David has a very ultra rare form of epilepsy, ring chromosome 20 syndrome or ring 20 or R20 for short. And he was diagnosed, well, with epilepsy when he was six years old, but we actually, after a couple of years, and actually identified that he had ring chromosome 20 syndrome. So we've been living with ring 20 for over 20 years now, learning and understanding from other families, this condition is like to live with day to day and how we cope. And I mentioned the other families because when David was originally diagnosed, we reached out through the internet and there was one other patient organization that existed at that time. And we found other families, which was a huge comfort and support for us. But unfortunately, that particular patient organization folded around 2010, 2011. And we realized alongside many of the other families that we'd connected with that there was no other support anywhere in the world to get information or or help from. So in 2014, myself and a, and a colleague set up a brand new organization. And this year it will be 10 years. I can't believe that since we set up um, Ring20 wow. Research and Support UK. So yeah, it's been a long journey so far and I guess a long journey ahead. But I think I'm learning every day in the rare disease space and the rare epilepsy space. What are what are some of the biggest challenges for families? And and maybe we can talk about research and support. So from a support perspective, what when families get in touch with you, what are the most common things that they're looking for help with? And then I'd love to hear about the research as well. Yeah. So the support side, really, if it, if a new family receive a diagnosis, as 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 with anything, it's often a shock, and then they want information. Because when you're diagnosed with a really ultra rare condition, like Ring20 as an example, your doctor will often say to you, ah, this is the condition you had. And as a parent, you'll say, well, what does that mean? What, what's going to happen? And unfortunately, there's so little information available, even to the medical professionals, about these ultra rare conditions, that there's very little that they can that they can tell you about the symptoms of the condition. So the main symptom will be refractory or very difficult to treat epilepsy, often seizures every day, different types of seizures, but also associated with challenging behaviours and cognitive 
decline actually from the seizure onset because the seizures don't start at birth. Interestingly, given this is a chromosome problem, right. um, they tend to start a few years into life. So the families have this sudden and severe onset of seizures. They receive after some time, and that can be, if they're very lucky, a very short diagnostic odyssey, but we've had up to 20 years to re- for, for an wow. individual to receive a diagnosis of, of ring 20. So it can take a long time to receive that diagnosis. So they they want to understand what's going on with their child or, or if it's them as an adult and an individual, which in some cases is the case. And what's going to happen today, they want to know what treatments are available, what's going to help. And unfortunately, there are no recommended treatments for Ring20. It's a trial and error situation still very much with anti-seizure medications and, and other treatments for, for epilepsies. Typically, because it's a chromosome problem, you know, brain surgery is, is not really an option for, for these people because which chromosomes do you take out of the brain cells? It's um, kind of difficult. So families want information. We provide that via our website and our social media channels. We offer welcome packs to new families. We've even produced, actually, since we last spoke, some information booklets in comic format. We actually have two two comics that we give to our brand new families for them to look through and share with, with their child, but also with caregivers and schools and so on and so forth to understand the condition. And we have a first booklet that's it's a fictional story, but it tries to encompass what might happen to a young girl who's diagnosed with Ring 20 as a, as a child in her childhood years. And then we have a second booklet from the sort of the, the 18 years and, and over, the, sort of the angsty years and dealing, yes. growing into adulthood and the, and the new challenges that you face there. And that was something that we we designed by families for families. So we actually had a workshop with our with some of our member families and had a really creative workshop and got them to say, what are all the things, if you wanted to know about Ring20, what would you want in this booklet? What's important? What do we need to share? And they even helped with a whole load of creativity in the design. We worked with with Deco Comics, which is fantastic. But they even we even had a competition to create a character who's now our mascot, Otzi. So that really helps The illustrative nature of that really helps to get across the challenges that might be faced. And I guess with any rare condition, typically there is always a range to symptoms or the thing you from the very mild to the very severe and everything in between. And that's the danger of the internet, of Dr. Google. When the families receive their diagnosis and not much information from their medical team, they go straight onto the internet. And what they can read can be frightening it can be very much out day so that's the other big thing that we do is connect them to other families who can talk to them about the journey they've been on so far what the seizures are like how they manage how they cope and support as a family because when you don't have treatments that can really help too much you have to find ways to live with your condition and live the best life that you can. So that's what we try and do is is, is provide that practical day-to-day support and particularly in connecting families because we're currently the only patient group in the world for this. We have families connecting with us from any country and in any language. So sometimes where English is not a native language, we have families connecting with us through sort of, you know, Google Translate and things like that. But we've now formed some Ring20 champions who are some of our members who do speak both English and a native language. And they can they are now helping to connect families in countries such as Spain and Germany and Italy and Belgium and even Japan and Australia. On a more sort of in, in local language, but also in local time zones as well. So we're really trying to help our families help each other and help ourselves and and while we wait for science and medicine to catch up with us. For those who aren't too familiar with the disorder, how common, how rare are we talking? I know you mentioned ultra rare and I I think I I can quote some of the statistics, but I'm I'm sure that there's there's probably issues with the literature because of how difficult it is to diagnose. And so maybe you can talk a little bit about how 
how many families there are in the UK, how many there are in the world that that are estimated, and and maybe also what might be missing because I, I don't think every family who's affected by this is is detected by any stretch. And I don't know if you or or the researchers you work with are able to estimate that from from the work that's been done to date. Yeah. So I actually contributed to an orphan net update a couple of years or so ago, and we talk about less than one in a million instance prevalence, but that's basically because we don't know. It's just there, according to the medical literature, the last literature review counted 200 individual cases in the world of Ring 20. Having said that, we as a patient group support around 130 families worldwide currently. So we are supporting over 60% of the number of reported cases. We actually plot the cases on an anonymized map to sort of show kind of roughly where in the world they're located. And as you can probably imagine, as much because of language barriers and finding us as a patient organization, quite a lot of our families are from the UK and the US. And then quite a few from Australia and then Europe, but all you know we have South America, India, and and all over the place. So I suspect very much that the literature is hugely underreporting the known diagnosed cases in, in in the first in the first instance. As an example of one country, I think we've got about three or four member families in Italy. It, that that sort of sign up to our mailing list, but we are very closely connected to neurologists in in Italy, and they they've done some great published work on about twenty five Italian families. So if we extrapolate that against all other countries, there's there's definitely going to be a lot more than two hundred cases worldwide. But the real reason why it's underreported goes even further than just reporting known cases. It is, as you alluded to, very much underdiagnosed. Now, I hear this, I've I've worked in the rare disease space for for quite a number of years now, but and many rare conditions will talk about underdiagnoses, but for ring chromosomes specifically, and you can have a ring chromosome on any one of the 23 pairs of chromosomes. We just happen to be on the 20th chromosome for this particular syndrome. The real challenge is that next generation sequencing, which is what is most commonly used for the genetic diagnoses in the high income countries around the world, will not actually diagnose a structural change in the chromosome. So what we have with a ring chromosome, really, really simply for listeners, is normally you have a pair of chromosomes that are linear. You know, they're just like a rod. and in the case of a ring chromosome, that rod, the two ends have stuck together as if like glue. And you have a, if you look down a microscope, you can see a circle or a ring formation. And next generation is sequencing. So I guess lots of people will have hold, heard of whole genome sequencing. And, and certainly in the UK, the 100,000 Genomes Project, which has been absolutely fantastic for an explosion in genetic and genomic diagnoses for, for many, many rare conditions. But that particular technique, they use something called short read sequencing, and it can't see a structural change. It's looking for a deletion, a duplication, a piece of the DNA that's not where it should be or is missing or is added or, or whatever. And in the case of people with Ring20 syndrome, in the majority of cases, there is no detectable change in the DNA. We do not know why yet that ring formation has mm. had why those ends of the, the chromosome have stuck together. Genomically, and I'm not a scientist or a medical, so disclaimer here, a medical person had no background. I've had to learn all of this over the years, but genomically, something must have changed to make those mm. ends sticky. But we don't know what that is. And so we don't have a target for therapy or for science to explore. But also one of the interesting points is we have a chromosome that's in a ring formation, but is the ring the problem? Is it the genomic change 
that's causing the symptoms that we see, the seizures and the behaviour and the, the cognitive impact? Or is the ring affecting the expression of genes on that 20th chromosome, which has been hypothesised? There are a couple of epilepsy genes that are highly associated with a couple of forms of epilepsy on that chromosome CHRNA4 and KCNQ2. But their symptoms, their seizures are nothing like ring 20. So that's kind of interesting. But also potentially, is the ring formation affecting gene expression on other chromosomes within the cell? And all of that is totally unknown. So in terms of both diagnosis and treatment, we have a really key challenge because we can't, it's probably very underdiagnosed. And actually, as a a patient group, we asked our members in what year they they received their Ring20 diagnosis. And we plotted it on a graph. And you'll be able to see this on our website. And actually, what we've shown is diagnostic decline over the last five to 10 years. And that's because what you need to do to see a structural change is to do a, what's called a karyotype. And karyotypes are not really being used. They were usually used looking for chromosome problems, and they're not used very commonly now. More commonly, you'll, you'll run a CGH, a Ray CGH test, exome sequencing, or if you're lucky, whole genome sequencing. And as I say, none of those will show you this structural change. And karyotype is not only I kind of talk about it as maybe a last resort, but sometimes it's not even considered. Right. So I think the clinicians or even the geneticists, you know, we need some changes in the genome test directory to bring awareness that if you're testing somebody for a refractory form of epilepsy, you're going to run your MRI and in Ring20, you won't find any structural change in the brain. So you'll have a clean MRI typically, you'll run an EEG and you will see a very typical abnormal EEG pattern, a lot of abnormal electrical activity in the brain. That's very typical people with Ring20. But that's very commonly associated, this sort of spike and wave pattern with Lennox-Gastel syndrome, which is one of the more common forms of rear epilepsy. But Lennox-Gastel syndrome or LGS is kind of a waste bucket of, as I call it, of, of epilepsies. Now, with such improved genetic and genomic uh, diagnostic techniques and MRI and EEG, um, people that were formerly diagnosed with LGS may now be seen to have a, a specific underlying etiology for their epilepsy. So we're interested at Ring20, you know, how many people potentially with lennox gastel syndrome to which many of our individuals will tick the boxes for the clinical symptoms yeah. might actually have ring 20, but have never been karyotype tested. And I've heard of a number of studies in the last few years where there are genomic and genetic studies going on in refractory epilepsy patient populations, particularly in the adult world of adult patients who perhaps didn't have any forms of genetic testing and still don't have a diagnosis for their cause of epilepsy but they're all using these newer techniques. And I've even spoken to some of the scientists and academics and researchers and said, hey, if you get negative results, would you ever consider running karyotype testing on any of those individuals if they conform to some of the the signs and symptoms of Ring20? And I've always, to this day, got to know. So I would love to talk to anybody who'd be interesting in looking at potentially undiagnosed or misdiagnosed Ring20 in either patient populations of people with refractory epilepsy with no etiology, which is a quite high percentage of people with epilepsies, or or those that already have a a bit of a bucket diagnosis, because we've had all sorts of diagnoses from our families before they landed on Ring20 as the the true cause. So yeah, that's a diagnosis is a big problem. And without yeah. diagnosis, we don't have patient cohorts for research, clinical trials and treatment. Stop right. It, it, it all starts there. And you highlighted you highlighted a big issue of the technology change left left a lot of people behind. And, and it, it would have left everyone with any ring chromosome behind, right? Because this problem you describe is not just ring 20, but it's 
and I, and the estimates that I've seen for ring chromosomes more broadly is between one in thirty thousand, one in sixty thousand births. And so that you know we're talking about a huge fraction of people, and and even if it's one in a million, you don't want to see anyone left behind with these kind of technology shifts. So it's it sounds like you're working on trying to advocate for not losing something that we've gained through 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 karyotyping and and leaving it behind. But I think you're also doing some work to try to see if the new new technology can can indeed detect these ring chromosomes. I'm I'm curious about some of the work you're doing with Illumina to look at this, you know, this from a next generation sequencing perspective. And and I know you haven't found anything conclusive yet, but maybe you can talk about what you're trying to do there. Yeah. So interestingly, I think around the sort of time we last spoke, I was actually invited to speak at a Cam Rare Summit in 2019. And I spoke about Ring20 and I kind of threw it out there to say we were actually at the Welcome Genome Campus and I said, hey, here we are at the home of the 100,000 Genomes Project and yet we can't yet diagnose a, a ring chromosome. And some guys from Illumina actually came up and spoke to me after I, I threw that out there and said, hey, that's really interesting. We'd love to talk to you some more. And in the last four years or so, We've continued that conversation into a, a partnership, which has been absolutely fantastic. So we, first of all, you know, they re- they recognised that, as you just said, for ring chromosomes generally, what we're seeing is new technology causing a problem and making things worse. And they they were very adamant that they as a technology company, do not want that to happen. And so they were very interested in working with us to see if they could find a way to make diagnosis easier with these these newer technologies. So we worked on an educational program, which we called Unravel, Making Genomic Understanding of Ring Chromosome 20 Possible. And we created a whole load of assets on our med- website and social media to, uh, with with the support and help of, of Illumina, to educate people on what is a ring chromosome and what is ring 20 and why it's formed and what we do know and what we don't know and the differences between genetics and genomics. Not trying to create a science lesson, but trying for people to understand why we've got so many unanswered questions and why that's then hampering us in scientific discovery for therapeutics. So we did a load of that work with them. And then we moved towards, that was kind of phase one of our work with them. And then phase two, they offered to do an R&D study to see if they could find a form of sequencing that will identify a ring chromosome. Now, this was quite a challenging journey because here we were a couple of years ago with a company who absolutely wanted to try and do something to help or willing to help us. And us as a patient group, patient community saying, yeah, we we really want to, to find this. And our, our family is saying, great, when do you want me to give blood? I can go be somewhere tomorrow. Where do you want me to go? You know, what do you want me to do? And what I discovered was you need a middleman that you can't, we couldn't just get, get get our families to send a blood sample to Illumina right. so that they, they could do the, the research they needed to do. And that was quite a challenge. But I was really lucky to be able to work with the patient-led research hub and the Cambridge Rare Disease Network, who helped me to navigate. We all worked together to navigate the system to find out what did we need to do and who did we need to partner with to find that middleman? And actually, who we found was the NIHR Bioresource. Amazing. And Yeah. And that they have a rare disease cohort where they can collect samples, so samples from individuals and some basic phenotypic information. And we were able to make an application to them to say, could Ring20 participants from the UK be added to that cohort so samples could be collected. And it it did take us a number of months to get all of the agreements and get everything sorted. But they said yes, and they were really keen to work with us. And so that's how we were able to facilitate getting samples ethically approved and, and through 
And Rare Disease Day last year, Illumina were able to start their research. At this point in time, we are still waiting to see how they're getting on. It is not an easy problem to solve. We know that because nobody's come up with trying to solve it just yet anyway. But we hope that we will be able to, they will be able to publish results on what they've found. And in an ideal world, we'll find a marker that makes diagnosis easier for ring chromosomes and ring 20 into the future. That's what we hope. If not, at least we'll know what we've tried. And it is fantastic to be on that journey with them and to have a company that's interesting, interested to try and solve problem with us. Yeah, I think that's super. I We know and work with the bioresource, and I didn't realize that you work with them. They're an amazing group. And and if people who want to learn more about the bioresource, they were, the director, Natalie Kingston, was actually on episode 75 of the podcast back in 2022. So you can go and hear about how they how they work and operate more broadly. But I just think they have such a great platform to do this kind of work from common to ultra rare diseases. They've been working for decades to to build the infrastructure to do these kind of studies. And so I think it's really great that you found them. And and who who helped you find them? Was it through the PLRH that you mentioned that that knew that maybe they could help with this? Exactly. Yeah. Yes, it, it, it was. And through through their connections. And actually, whilst the work that we did to get about nine or 10 samples that we just needed for this initial Illumina study, we did that. Uh, through piggybacking off of one of the existing rare disease cohorts, we've now had an application accepted and we're just working through some of the last paperwork to have a brand new ring chromosomes cohort set up. So we hope in the next few months to be able to start collecting samples from lots of individuals with ring chromosomes around the UK so that those samples and that phenotypic information and access to the, you know, the consent to access clinical records for for academic research will be available because that's a key missing link for these individuals. And we're we're working very closely with Unique, the red chromosome disorder group, and that's how we'll be able to find other people with with ring chromosome disorders to come forward as well. So it's, it's big news. It goes beyond ring 20 and hopefully we're trying to help others along the way. Yeah, I guess you've probably learned a lot through this process and you've been helping other groups through what you've learned here to take their own patient-led research and figure out how to make it a reality. What what are you doing with that and what kinds of problems? Do, are, is it often these kind of operational and logistical problems or what kinds of things do people typically need help with when they're thinking through this kind of patient-led research angle? So, so ab- absolutely. I think many patient groups and patient advocates, you'd spend a long time learning about your own rare condition and you come up with theories or ideas, if you like, of things that you'd really like investigated. Your patient community, you get to know what the real and the biggest problems are for the individuals. But Quite often, you don't have clinicians or researchers or those connections, partnerships, collaborations to make those research ideas happen. And this is exactly where the patient led research hub can come along and help to turn your ideas into action. They can help to refine your ideas into a valid research question. Um, which is how they helped us um, with the Illumina work and facilitate, you know, creating those partnerships, working your way through the different minefields, ethics. I never, I never knew how difficult it, yeah. it can be to to navigate and the red tape that absolutely it's there for a reason, but you need help in finding it, and that's what PLRH Patient Led Research Hub have been doing for some time, but they're quite a small group and there are an awful lot of research ideas from from patient groups out there. And one of the things that they they started last year with CAMREA is the Rare Disease Research Network. And I am, along with many other patient advocates, are helping them to develop a new Rare Disease Research Network to really expand on the sort of work that PLRH have done in the past 
and be able to explode that multiply that multiple times so that the opportunities to turn all these fantastic research ideas, connect partnerships, refine, help with navigating research that's already available and finding out what's not available, creating partnerships and actually advocating research to happen. So we're turning research on its head yes. and it's it's taking research because typically in the past, research comes from the researchers having an idea. And I guess flippantly, I've kind of come to sort of think that sometimes that's because that's their, their particular researcher's pet interest is in X, whatever X might be. And if you're lucky, X is your rare condition. And therefore, people are interested in researching that. But as we know, there are many thousands of rare conditions, and so there are not enough researchers to get them interested. So we as patient advocates need to get them excited, and the Red Seas Research Network should be a platform that will be launched later this year that will be an enabler to getting those ideas out into the world. And I'm really excited to be you know, using our journey of the with, with Illumina, with the guys at the Research Network as a case study to, to show others what's possible if you, if you all work together and how a new platform could perhaps add a little bit more kind of automation to, to some of this to make it happen yeah. a little bit faster for more people, more groups. That's super. I, I love that. And if anyone wants to learn more, the patient-led research hub is plrh.org. It's based out of Cambridge University, but I think they, and, and they operate across the UK, is my understanding, via the NIHR, the National Institute for Health Research, and a couple other partners that you can see on their website. We're coming up against the end of the episode here, but I wanted to talk about another multiplier effect that you've been a part of, which is the UK Rare Epilepsies Together Network that I mentioned at the very top of the show. And, and you've mentioned a couple of times that Ring20 is is just one of many rare epilepsies. And often there's a lot of common common cause that you can find with other patient organizations and families that share not every challenge, but many of the same challenges that you do. I love if you could talk a little bit about the origin behind forming that group and some of the things that you're hoping to accomplish. Yeah. So I spent about five years working as co-lead for the patient advocacy group for Epicare, the European Reference Network or ERM for rare and complex epilepsies. And I learned so much about other rare epilepsies beyond Ring20 in, in my years in post there. And the ERNs are working, as I say, the European Reference Network, so working at a European, a regional level in the world. And I then took on some contracting work for Rare Diseases International, so looking at the global rare disease and how we area and how we can create networks around the world to connect research and, and information and care, improve care for all people with rare diseases around the world. So looking at things at a global scale. But one of the things that I learned on both of those journeys was that before you can advocate for change on a European or regional level or even a global level, even though sometimes the knowledge and experience isn't always in your country, you can't necessarily influence and leverage change outside of your own country. It's very, very difficult if you're in the UK to make change happen in Spain, for example. But what we can influence potentially is change on a more national level. We have a, a voice with our, within the UK to advocate to our MPs, to the politicians, to the NHS, the commissioners, to advocate for good practice, best practice for diagnosis, treatment and care for people with rare conditions. So to make change on a national level, then you can grow and extrapolate that on a, a more much like global scale. So I, a couple of years ago, decided that there was no, there was no collaboration between the various individual rare epilepsy patient support groups. So I thought, well, why don't we all come together? Because Ring20 is one of the really, really rare epilepsies. And it was just, 
it is so challenging to be seen and be heard. And what I did learn through the European reference networks is that whilst all the rare epilepsies are slightly different, we have so many underlying common unmet needs and so many things that we want changed in the same way and that we could advocate for those together and be a much louder voice. So I invited other rare epilepsy patient groups and the umbrella epilepsy groups such as Epilepsy Action, Epilepsy Society, Young Epilepsy. We even have the Epilepsy Research Institute with us and we have a full a network now of just under 30 patient support organisations who come together and we work together to try to make change happen. As I say, we want to, we all want to improve the diagnostic journey. We we want we all want better treatments. And so we need more joined up research and research thinking. And we all need better care because whilst there's an absence of, of treatments for the seizures and the other many comorbidities that are experienced, we we all want individuals to have best quality of life. So UK Rep, UK Rare Epilepsies Together is a network where we we work to to try to make that change happen. And we've had some really exciting initiatives already. Last year, I think a, a highlight was working with Genomics England. We had a, a round table, which we hope is a first of, a, of several um, discussions with them. And this was a first of its kind, as we understand, as a rare disease collaboration. And we had a, a morning with them understanding how Genomics England, what data is available and to whom and how it can be accessed. And also sharing back from the patient advocacy and the medical advisory representation that we had present, you know, what we would like them to know and where there's information available and how we can join that up, work better together. And that's really, really exciting. That would never have happened for Ring 20 on its own. It would never yes. have made sense. But, you know, it, it's something that we, we, we're trying to change. Um, and we have a number of other initiatives. We have a, a medical advisory board for the network because we recognise that some of the really small, newer charities don't even have medical advisory boards right. to advise those. So we think there's potential for the for UK RET to be a model for other rare disease groups uh, of conditions that share in similarities to come together to be one voice. That doesn't detract or take away from the day job that we do in supporting our individual families and patient communities because we are the experts on our individual conditions. But if we want change to happen, it's more likely to happen in a collaborative environment. And that's what I'm taking forward with UK Rec. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, congratulations on all the amazing progress you've made in the last, hasn't quite been, how long has it been? A little bit less than five years, uh, but it seems like you've, you've, pushed on the advocacy, you've pushed on the research, you've started a couple new organizations, you are, you're staying busy with the pandemic in between. It, it certainly, certainly, yeah, never a dull moment. Yeah. And that, as I said at the beginning, I think learning something every day, I think it's fascinating, you know, to work within the rare disease space and, you know, patient advocates are going to make change happen. That is changing. That is something that is definitely changing. There is more influence and listening and cooperation with patient advocates. So it's a working with clinicians and researchers, not instead of, and, and I think there is a shift change happening. Um, we have a role to play. We have a lot to offer in terms of knowledge and experience from a different perspective, but just as valuable to be considered when we're trying to understand these really complex conditions and find answers for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time and and giving us an update on all the progress you've made and, and hopefully teaching some more people about ring chromosomes, rare epilepsies, in case their you know, personal interests, research interests overlap with this, then, then they can reach out and hopefully help you make progress even faster. Thanks very much for having me. My pleasure. All right. And thanks, everybody, as always, for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, we'd really appreciate if you shared it with a friend or colleague that you think would like it as well. And of course, you can always leave us a review on your favorite podcast player that helps other people that are into genetics and precision medicine 
find this podcast and hopefully take something from it and, and learn from it. So thanks again, and we will see you next time. That wraps up this week's episode of the Genetics Podcast. I'd like to give a huge thank you to our guests for sharing their valuable insights and experience. And thank you as well to our listeners, as always, for tuning in. If you enjoyed today's talk, the number one thing I would really appreciate from you is if you could share it with a friend or colleague who you think would enjoy it as well. We would also really appreciate if you could subscribe to our show and give us a quick rate and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. Both of these things help us become more visible when people search for genetics and precision medicine podcasts. And we're always eager to hear from you. Please reach out to us with any questions or feedback on social media. You can find Sonogenetics on Twitter, LinkedIn, or visit sonogenetics.com. Finally, a big thank you to the team behind the scenes who make all this possible. In particular, Amy Cousins and Sonia Shah who produced the show, and James Pierce from Selective Frequencies who handles the audio engineering. I'm Patrick Short, your host, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you, and we'll see you next time on the Genetics Podcast.